In the Garden with Dr. Carver by Susan Grigsby. I'll never forget the Sunday that we stepped out of church and saw an old mule waiting beside a funny looking wagon. The man with the wagon was George Washington Carver, the famous plant scientist from the big school in Tuskegee. Dr. Carver called the wagon his movable school, and it was piled high with plants, tools, and seeds. The adults all gather, gathered around, eager for advice. They had heard about the 20-pound cabbages and the onions as big as a young child's head that Dr. Carver had grown on land just like ours. He said that plants get from the soil the foods that they need to make them grow. But cotton, like a hungry monster, had gobbled up the good foods in Alabama's soil. Dr. Carver was showing folks how to make our poor soil healthy again. He was even teaching people how to turn simple foods like peanuts and sweet potatoes into luxuries like coffee, butter, and sugar. Hundreds of new products poured out of his laboratory, all made from plants that we could grow. For me, the best part of Dr. Carver's visit was that he agreed to stay through Monday to help us with the garden at our school. Who here would like to learn to be a plant doctor? Dr. Carver asked. I waved my hand the hardest, so he asked me to observe the first case. So, Dr. Sally, he said, why do you think that this rose bush is looking so weak when her cousins by the fence are covered in beautiful red roses. I don't know, I admitted. What should I do first? Listen to the plants and they'll tell you what they need. Go on. I thought about what Dr. Carver meant. Maybe it was like listening to the wind and watching the sky to tell the weather. I looked over at the healthy roses, basking in the bright sunshine. Then I examined my patient. Just one single rose grew on her entire bush as she sat all alone in the shade beside the shed. I've got it, I cried out. My patient needs to be moved to where she'll get more sunlight. That is an excellent job of observation, Dr. Sally, Dr. Carver said. Now let us begin the operation. Dr. Carver showed us how to transplant the rose bush very carefully without damaging her roots or letting her scratch us. When I was a boy, said Dr. Carver, drawing and plants were my two passions. I mixed my own paints and covered stones and discarded boards with pictures of the flowers. And I was always asking questions. I wanted to know the names of every strange stone and flower, every insect, bird, and beast that visited the garden. We wanted to know all about the garden, too, so we just sat there quiet, watching, listening to nature, and drawing the beetles and bees, flowers and fungi, worms and birds, and pretty bits of stones. I never knew our garden was such a busy place. And Dr. Carver knew the names of everything. My brother Ben found a big web stretched out like a fishing net spun of the finest lace. On it waited a huge and hungry spider. Ben raised a stick ready to kill it when Dr. Carver stopped him. That spider is helping your garden, explained Dr. Carver by eating up the creatures that want to eat your plants. Before you change or destroy something, you need to understand why it exists and its relationship with the rest of nature. The plants, the soil, and the animals that visit are all connected, just like a web. Every single flower bed 
dandelions held up their sunny yellow heads. Who planted all of these? Lucy asked. That would be old man wind, chuckled Dr. Carver. He showed us how the fluff of a dandelion puffball was really a family of hundreds of seeds. Carried by the wind, they could travel miles before landing and beginning to grow. A plant is a weed if it's growing uninvited, we learned. Those greedy dandelions were taking food, light, and water from the flowers that our teacher, Miss Simpson, had planted. Dr. Carver showed us how to remove the dandelions, pulling them up by their long legs and hungry roots. We saved their youngest leaves for our lunchtime salad. Dr. Carver said that we should eat all of the fruits and vegetables that we could. By then, we were as hungry as a pack of wild dandelions. Miss Simpson and the older students had cooked a delicious spread of picnic food using recipes invented by Dr. Carver. After every bit was gobbled up, they told us what we'd eaten. Sweet potato flour bread, chicken made from peanuts, and a salad of strange wild weeds. And for dessert, peanut ice cream and cake. After our feast, Dr. Carver said that it was time to plant our own kitchen garden. We followed him to the lot behind our school. This spot's no good, Emmett said. It's sunny, but the soil's rock hard. See, it won't budge. He's right, I said. Nothing ever grows out here, not even weeds. And nothing ever will unless we improve this worn out land, said Dr. Carver. Plants, like people, need nutritious food to help them grow. Dr. Carver took us to a patch of forest near our school. We scooped up buckets full of rich and leafy loam. While we worked, he explained how rotting plants were full of good things to feed healthy plants. Leaf mulch, swamp muck, and the decaying roots of peanuts, peas, and beans will all enrich the soil, he said. You can make your own fertilizer too. I'll leave Miss Simpson my recipe for compost. Paper shreds, vegetable scraps, anything that breaks down quickly will put nutrients back into the soil. So much of what people waste can be put to good use. We cleared the plot of stones, spaded and hoed, chopped and raked, turning and mixing into the soil, the forest hummus we gathered. We worked that soil until we had a fine, rich field. Then we divided it into plots. We planted sweet potato slips and peanuts, snap beans, lima beans, cow peas, squash, okra, and melons. Carver asked us to show him the nearest dump. We found wood scraps to use for our plant markers and a raggedy headed mop to make a tall scarecrow. When Clarence grumbled about picking through the dump, Dr. Carver told us how he made test tubes, lamps, and all sorts of tools for his laboratory from the reused treasures of just such a dump. The word treasure set Clarence's eyes on fire and he kept picking until he found a fine costume for our shaggy headed scarecrow. Back at school, we used milk paint to label our garden signs so that we'd remember what we'd planted where. We all sad to see Dr. Carver leave, but he made Miss Simpson promise to take us outdoors every day for nature study and gardening lessons. And he gave her papers he'd written to use as our school guides. And we promised Dr. Carver that we wouldn't eat wild weeds as some can be very poisonous, until our teacher taught us which ones were safe. 
Some people come in and out of your life as quick as a hummingbird darting at a trumpet vine. And some of them, when gone, leave something behind that sticks in your heart or mind. It sticks to you like a little burr on your sock. It wraps around you like the tendrils of a vine. Since that day that we spent in the garden with Dr. Carver, whenever I step among flowers, trees, or vegetables, I remember his woods. Listen to the plants, and they'll tell you what they need. And they do. This story is historical fiction. It is based on the history of Dr. George Washington Carver and his writings. Dr. Carver was born into slavery on a Missouri farm about a year before slavery was abolished. He spent his early years seeking out schools and learning all they offered. He taught botany at Iowa State College while earning a master's degree in agricultural science. In 1896, Booker T. Washington asked Dr. Carver to be the head of the Department of Agricultural Agriculture at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Dr. Carver worked there until his death in 1943. Dr. Carver dedicated his life to helping people improve their lives by working with what nature provided. In addition to teaching the students at Tuskegee, he wanted to help the farmers across the South. He wrote many bulletins to teach people how to take care of the earth, how to farm, and how to make the things they needed. He also wrote booklets for teachers explaining ways to conduct nature studies in the schools. But Dr. Carver realized that many people would learn best by being shown what to do. So on weekends, using an old wagon pulled by a mule, Dr. Carver took a movable school out into the Alabama countryside to teach. In 1906, he outfitted a better wagon and called it the Jessup Wagon after Mr. Morris K. Jessup, who donated the money for it. By 1918, he was using a truck. Dr. Carver's idea of a movable school was adapted in places as far away as China and India.